Amen. And it is great to be here with you this morning. This past week actually offered us a little spring weather. And it's my prayer that you were able to enjoy it, get out into it, because it sounds like maybe Monday and Tuesday we may not have that. But I would like to invite you back this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Pastor Lane has probably already said this. A lot of times I don't listen to him when he's talking, but I'm sure you mentioned this. Uh, at 3 o'clock this afternoon is our local church conference. And members are going to be voting on leadership positions for the coming year, which is important. But I want to invite you to come and join us, even if you're not a member. For you see, God is doing some pretty exciting things here at Sunlight and in the ministries of the church. And I'd like for you to hear some of those things from those who are leaders in those ministries. I also am going to be sharing a vision of where I believe God is directing us in the future. So it's, uh, it's going to be a great time to come back, and I hope that you'll consider coming back. We've recently established a vision committee, and, and part of that vision committee is and the discussions we've had, I'll be sharing some of those conversations this afternoon as well. So please come back. Join us today at 3 o'clock uh, for our local church conference. It's going to be a great time. I do want to praise the Lord for the last two weeks of services. Palm Sunday, Easter were just amazing services filled with many, many blessings. And uh, I think we just need to give the Lord uh, thanks once again for those services. Yeah. But today, we're going to return to the series we were doing before, Overcoming Your Giants. And today, we're going to go up against the giant called anger. Have you ever noticed that this world that we live in is a pretty angry place? The word rage has developed a large group of qualifiers. We have road rage, we have parking rage, we have shopping rage, we have grocery cart rage, we have everything that can have rage attached to it. The point is that rage can be attached to any word. And the thing that makes anger so incredibly dangerous is that it can begin in an instant. It seems as though everyone has a short fuse, and it can be ignited at the smallest of events. It would seem that anger has really sort of reached a toxic level in our world today, and we have individuals who spend their entire adult lives immersed in anger. And this morning, I'd like to take a look at the two sides of anger, because believe it or not, there are two sides of anger. And the first side is, is recognizing that we have something called sinless anger. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says this, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Well, I don't think any of us would expect to see a verse in Scripture telling us it's okay to be angry. I mean, especially when we've seen what anger can cause. Anger is recognized as a product of sin. So, so why does Paul tell us to be angry? Some might look at that verse and say, well, that's a contradiction. That's one of those confusing verses that we really don't know what he's talking about. But I, I think we do. And we'll take a look at that. Paul tells us to be angry, but do not sin. Is that possible? And, and if so, how does that happen? What does Scripture say about anger? Well, Scripture actually has a lot to say about anger. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 22, we find these words. It says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, which means worthless, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Proverbs 29, 11 tells us fools, will g fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. Psalm 37, 8 says, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. So we have these and many other passages that speak against anger. But Paul seems like he's telling us to be angry. It's, it's okay. Is there such a thing as anger without sin? Well, I believe that we can find that answer to the question by looking into the life and the emotions of Jesus. If, you, if, you are to be like, if we are to be like Jesus, then he must be our model in this. 
Jesus expressed anger on more than one occasion. The one that probably has already popped into your mind was the time Jesus went into the temple and created quite a stir. In John 2, we can read the account of Jesus going into the temple, found that the temple had been turned into a market of sorts. And it's written that when Jesus saw this going on, he carefully constructed a whip of rope and began to chase all the merchants out of the temple. Now, not only did he chase them out, but he overturned their tables and caused the money to drop on the floor. But to understand Jesus' anger, we need to understand the money changers. We need to understand what was going on with them. They were not just selling goods. They were extorting the worshipers in the most holy of places. The temple was the only place to worship. And on the festival days, when the people were asked to bring a sacrifice, they were told that their animal that they brought for sacrifice was not acceptable. There was something wrong with it. But they could purchase a replacement sacrifice from one of the vendors. Now, the priests, they had a really sweet deal going on here. They, they had a deal in place where they would get a kickback from every person that, that they would send to these vendors, and they would get an animal from them. And they would take their animal that they brought in, which was perfectly fine, was acceptable, and they say, well, your animal is not good enough. So you leave your animal here, and you go buy one from one of the vendors. That was a sweet deal. The merchants had, had, had set up their tents on the inside, which, which probably made Jesus even angrier because they set those tents up inside the court of the Gentiles, and that was the only place that Gentiles could come and worship. But the merchants had cut it off with all of their supplies in there. And Jesus knew that his plan was that when he came was to seek and save the lost, including the Gentiles, and there was no way that Jesus was ever going to allow this continue. And this is why the anger welled up inside of Jesus. But what was remarkable about his anger? What sanctified his anger compared to ours? Well, the key is this. Jesus was not angry at any injustices towards him. When he was delivered to Herod, when he was taken to Pilate, we saw no anger from Jesus. When he was beaten or mocked by the soldiers and crowd, no anger from Jesus. Not even earlier in his ministry when the crowd was pushing him towards a cliff, no anger from Jesus. His anger was a righteous anger directed at injustice against people and against God. Now I would venture to say that when we get angry, that's not the case for us. We probably get angry about a number of things during our life, but, but when was the last time we became angry about starving our homeless children, our people dying without hearing the gospel message? You see, righteous anger is never about us. It is always forgetful of self. Another instance of Jesus' anger is found in, in Mark chapter 3, verse 5. A man had a withered hand was brought before Jesus and immediately Jesus felt compassion for the handicapped man and healed him. But soon after the healing, Jesus was confronted because the healing took place on the Sabbath. And in healing on the Sabbath and so doing that, it violated their understanding of the Hebrew laws. In Mark 3, chapter 5, we read this account where Jesus said he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched that out and his hand was completely destroyed or restored. Jesus was frustrated at the people because they did not get it. They once again misunderstood the law and didn't comprehend compassion or redemptive law that overrode the fine print of the law that they were following. More importantly, they did not understand about Jesus himself and his purpose for coming. Jesus was angry. He was righteously angry. And there is such a thing as righteous, sinless anger. But be careful. Because I've had people tell me in the past that they were righteously angry. And their anger was anything but that. But they thought they could justify their anger by calling it righteous. So we see the first part of the, the Ephesians passage as possible, to be angry and not sin. But let's look at the latter part of that verse where Paul tells us not to allow our anger to turn into sin and give Satan a foothold. We have to renounce sinful 
anger. Ephesians 4.31, which is a continuation of the previous verse that Paul wrote, tells us this. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. This is the kind of anger that you and I are more likely to experience. We claim to be expressing righteous indignation from time to time, but most of the time what we are expressing is your garden variety of anger, bitterness, grudges, tantrums, pet peeves. We live in an angry world. There's a lot to be angry about. So how can we handle that anger? Well, the first thing we need to do is do not nurse your anger. Don't nurse your anger. We need to remember, and you need to write this down. You need to take a picture of the screen. You need to write it on your hand, whatever you need to do. But you need to write this down. We need to remember that anger is a choice. Anger is a choice. We saw this idea of choice when we spoke about temptation earlier in the series. In one defining moment, you and I, when we experience anger, we have a choice. We can send it away and not allow it to linger, or we can hang on to it and start to build a little nest of sorts. Scripture tells us that we are not to let the sun set on our anger. That's a nice way of saying, make sure your accounts are clear before the end of the day so you can start a new day fresh. Maybe you can enforce a 12-hour limit on your feelings of anger. I'm sure that you've heard the phrase, do not go to bed angry with your spouse. Well, that's great advice, but it's hard to take. Because of the seven deadly sins, anger is the one that seems to taste the best to us. For some reason, when we experience anger, we welcome it. And we begin to fantasize about how we can get back at the person who did us wrong and so we can really let them have it. Or we begin to plot our revenge, and the longer we hang on to that anger, the more elaborate our fantasies of revenge become. Let me ask you a question. If, if someone were to record all of your times of anger, or all of the times you thought about revenge, all the holding of anger, and, and they recorded it, and they wrote it down in a book, how big would your book be? Would it be a book that you would want others to read? Or would it be a book that you'd want to hide so nobody actually knew what was going on in your life? There was a person who had gone through a painful and bitter divorce 15 years prior and could not move past it. They had gone to a, a number of support groups over the years to no avail and their bitterness and anger continued and it was getting worse. And one day they were asked by their counselor why, why they could not let go of their anger. And their response was this. This is the only story I have. It's the only story I have. Nurtured anger is no way to live. Anger consumes us like a cancer that becomes toxic and becomes a poison that kills the spirit. Because you see, sometimes we can allow anger to come inside of us and it wells up so much inside of us that that's the only thing we know. And if we were ever to let that anger go, what would we have? We wouldn't have anything. So you must not nurse anger, but instead rid yourselves of it before it consumes you. Is there anger inside of you today? The second thing is this. Don't rehearse your anger. We probably know people who love to tell you about their anger. It seems that this is the only thing that they speak about. And the fact is that this person may be the one who greets you in the hallway and says, wait until you've heard the latest. This is a person who has become consumed by anger. There was a man by the name of Henry Brandt who commented and said that he believed it was a fallacy to say that some other person makes us angry. According to Brandt, that is something that can't be done. 
If we become angry, it is because we had anger already inside of us and we have allowed someone else to pull it out of us. But no one can make us angry. And I can see truth in that statement because I have seen people who maintain a feeling of anger in them and it doesn't matter what is said to them, they become angry. It's, it's almost like they manufacture anger, which is accomplished by rehearsing their anger over and over and over again. Because that's what we do. In our mind, we rehearse that, all that. We go over and over what someone has said, and we begin to read things into the situation that were never a part of it. But the more we allow that anger to fester in our mind, the bigger and more terrible the issues become. And it's sort of like putting gas on a fire, which is a bad idea, I want to tell you. But, but we do that in our minds all the time. The more rehearsing we do, the bigger the fire. So you can't nurse your anger. You're not supposed to rehearse your anger. And the third thing is don't converse about your anger. You know, the mouth is a deadly weapon. Don't let it become a promoter of anger. Ephesians 4.29 tells us, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. The word unwholesome carries with it the idea of cutting remarks. Have you ever known someone whose words can cut like a knife? We live in a society that is, that is full of more and more disrespect, probably more so than any other generation. This idea of conversing about our anger, but not only doesn't just deal with our speech anymore. Today, we converse about our anger by using a keyboard, a tablet, or a phone screen. And it saddens me whenever I go onto a social media site and we see the anger and hatred that is being spewed out in total disregard of any other person's feelings. Many people think that, it, that since it isn't coming straight from their mouth, that it doesn't count. I'm shocked at what people will put online and hide behind the anonymity of a screen and express all kinds of anger. And what happens is when they express that anger, someone else sees that anger and they continue to make comments and that anger just gets more and more and more and more. We need to be careful that we don't allow that type of conversation to filter in our lives and cause us to react with anger in response to the situation. Proverbs 22, 24, and 25 says this, do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. After hearing and reading that passage, allow me to pass on this thought. Have you ever considered the relationships and friends you choose may be setting you up for a soul trap? So when anger enters into your lives, we must not nurse it. We're not supposed to rehearse it. And you're not supposed to converse it. So then what do we do? If that's the case, then what? Well, you need to reverse your anger. Anger in reverse. What what does that mean? I would guess that all of us have done things that we wish we could reverse. We've either broken something, done something, or said something that we would like to rewind the tape and reverse the damage. But time is irreversible. Scripture, however, offers an alternative way to reverse things. The prescriptions that the Bible offers seems like foolishness to the world. If someone causes anger to boil inside of you, You're to offer them love in return. If someone threatens harm, we're to feel compassion for them. Make them, make those feelings inside of them to be dealt with by them. Instead of retaliation, we're to offer redemption. Romans 12, 20 says this, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And this verse actually refers to an old Egyptian custom where if a person committed some kind of misdeed, 
They felt that the only way to, to express their shame and contrition within their hearts was that they would place a pan of hot coals on their head. If someone wrongs you, see what happens when you return right for wrong. That simple act may in itself be enough to turn your snarl into a smile. That is what we mean by reversing your anger. We pay out the reverse of what we might feel. Is it an easy thing to do? No, not at all. It takes wisdom, it takes maturity, it takes self-control, but the result will be well worth it. And in doing this, we show that we don't have that hot anger inside of us. We're, we're all out of worldly wrath, but we have plenty of loving kindness, tenderness, and forgiveness in stock to pass out. And we need to lean heavy on the grace and benefit of the doubt. We find some way, some action to encourage the aggressor. And in the process of doing this, it will dissolve any anger that your soul can whip up. We need to allow grace to dissolve our anger. Grace isn't the natural way to behave, though. It's the supernatural way. Because the only way that we can give grace and the only way we can serve grace and offer grace is by having Christ in our life. We cannot offer grace if that's not there. The world should expect Christians to do something beyond the natural thing. To be able to take all the wrong and the evil and the persecution in the world that they can dish out and to meet it with a double dose of love and compassion. And this is the visible evidence of God. It's the most powerful witness that can possibly be offered. It's a living picture worth a thousand words. Reuben Carter was a boxer who was wrongly convicted of three murders. He spent more than two decades in prison paying the price for someone else's crimes. Now, I pray that none of you ever have to live through this in your life. But what type of thoughts or emotions right, might run through your mind if you did? This is what Reuben said upon his release from prison. He said, the, the question inevitably arises. It has before and it will be again. Reuben, are you bitter? And in answer to that, I will say, after all that's been said and done, the fact that the most productive years of my life between the age of 29 and 50 have been stolen, the fact that I was deprived of seeing my children grow up, grow up wouldn't you think I would have a right to be bitter? Wouldn't anyone under those circumstances have a right to be bitter? In fact, it would be very easy for me to be bitter. But that has never been my nature are my lot, to do things the easy way. He said, if I have learned nothing else in my life, I've learned that bitterness only consumes the vessel that contains it. And for me to permit bitterness to control or to infect my life in any way whatsoever would be to allow those who imprison me to take even more than the 22 years they've already taken. Now that would make me an accomplice to their crime. Reuben might have been filled with a hurricane of emotions. Most people would have been. But he knew that one crime was enough. Why perpetuate it? Somewhere all evil, all wrongdoing must be punctuated. Let me tell you that one more time. All wrongdoing must be punctuated. Someone must put down a period instead of a comma. Otherwise, life is going to be one long run-on sentence without parole. Reuben's sentence had been long enough. He did not need to have it carried on by anger and bitterness towards those who had done this to him and had done him wrong. Anger needs to be and can be punctuated. And we need to do so. We reverse the anger and release it to God. We just celebrated Easter, a weekend that included Jesus who was beaten beyond recognition, made to carry his own instrument of death, a cross, nailed to that cross and hung on it until death. 
And while he was hanging on the cross, he uttered the words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Now, he could have cursed those who were doing what they were doing to him, but instead he was asking for them to be forgiven. He was enduring all types of evil, but Jesus reversed the evil. He took it all upon his body and offered a prayer of forgiveness. Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they're doing. And when Jesus chose that reaction, the greatest of all miracles occurred. Sin was ignored. It was healed. It was healed. Death was destroyed. A long chain of evil dating all the way back to creation was broken. A new pattern was established. And it is one that we're to live out in our own lives today. Good for evil. Blessings for curses. Compassion for aggression. On this day, the days we live like this, miracles begin. When we let go of our anger. When we put a period at the end of it instead of a comma. Because I said at the beginning, anger is a choice. If you've got anger inside of you, it's your choice to keep it there. Because you can get rid of it. You can pass it on. You can give it to God. And on the day that we do that, miracles begin. On that day, we will be liberated from a self-imposed prison of anger and be granted freedom to live in peace and joy. Are you angry? Are you hurt? Are you resentful of something that has been said to you, something that has been done, done to you, and, and you're hanging on to that? It's there. You need to let it go. You need to live above the anger that the world wants us to have. You know, it's easy to be angry because we're just like the world then. But Christ is saying you have to live above the world. You have to live above what the world is telling you is normal. Because the world will say, it's normal to be angry. I mean, people just make you mad. It's not. It may happen, but you can let it go. Are you holding it inside of you? Are you holding that heartache? And I would ask you to release it to God this morning. And see what miracles can take place when you actually let go of the anger inside of you and allow the joy and happiness and grace of Christ to take its place. Would you stand with me, please? I'm going to ask that you would close your eyes and bow your heads. I'm going to ask Jean to play some, some quiet music in the background. I simply want to ask you a question. You're the only one that can answer it. Nobody else can. If you're here with your spouse, your spouse may say, yeah, that's true. But let me ask you a question. Are you angry? Is there anger inside of you that you've been hanging on to for a long time or maybe just a short time? And that anger is just getting worse. It's building up more and more inside of you. Because that's what it does. It builds up so much that we can't function anymore because we can't get past the anger. Well, this morning I wanna give you an opportunity to punctuate that anger and put a period at the end of it. And that happens when you bring it to the altar and say, Lord, I want to get rid of this. I don't want it anymore. I know it's a choice to have inside me, but it's also my choice to give it to you. And this morning, my choice is to give it to you. We're going to wait for just a short amount of time. We're not going to wait for a long time. But if you're here this morning and you're carrying hurt, you're carrying anger, you're carrying resentment towards a thing or a person, it's time to let go of it. I ask that you would come to the altar this morning 
bring it to the altar. Allow someone to come beside you and just stand there with you. They don't need to say a thing, but they just stand beside you saying, I've been where you're at. I know what you're going through, but give it over to God. If God is speaking to you, if God has has spoken to you throughout this service this morning and there is anger that you need to release, the altars are open. We invite you to come. just a minute more if anyone else would like to come Lord, it would be easy for all of us to say the anger that we're dealing with is a righteous anger. But Lord, we know that when we say that, that's probably not the case. We're dealing with anger because of the world we live in. We're dealing with anger because of of things that people have said or things that people have done. And Lord, we take that anger inside of us and and, and that's understandable, but your word says that it needs to be gotten rid of. We need to let it go. And so, Lord, this morning, I pray for those who have, have come to the altar this morning, whatever they bring to you this morning, whatever anger might be there, Lord, or hurt, resentment, whatever it might be, Lord, that they would find a healing with you this morning and as they put a period at the end of that that they would get up from the altar this morning all those feelings that were going on inside of them before they came to the altar are gone you've taken them and I pray Lord that you will just begin to bring peace and comfort inside of them Lord for those who may be in the pews this morning maybe watching online this morning who are still trying to deal with that Lord, I pray that you continue to speak to them throughout this day and the week to come. And Lord, bring them to a position where they too come before you and say, Lord, I I don't want to live this way anymore. I don't need it. I don't want it. And I want to give it to you. And Lord, we'll give you thanks and praise when that takes place. So Lord, we ask now that you would just release us with your benediction and your blessing, Lord, that you would travel with us throughout this day and the week to come, that Lord, that we would... You would give us opportunities where we would be able to share with those around us. And Lord, when those things come against us that would give us an opportunity to be angry, I pray, Lord, that we would reverse those things and act as you desire us to. And instead of anger, we give compassion. We give love. And Lord, we just pray that you would just fill us with that power to be able to do that. And we ask all of these things in your precious and holy name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a great week. Hope to see many of you back this afternoon at 3. God bless.